We're busy with a study in the book of Titus, so would you turn there with me to the book of Titus. It's one of Paul's letters that he wrote to men like Timothy and Titus, which are very specifically focusing on uh, the life of the church. And uh, much of what he says in both of those letters is focused on what it is to be uh, a church member and very specifically what it is to be a leader in the church and who is qualified to do that. And would you turn with me to Titus chapter 1 and we'll read uh, the f- verse 5 to verse 9 together this morning. So Titus 1 verses 5 to 9. For this reason I left you in Crete, that you would set in order what remains and appoint elders in every city as I directed you. Namely, if any man is beyond reproach, the husband of one wife, having faithful children who are not accused of dissipation or rebellious. For the overseer must be beyond reproach as God's steward, not self-willed, not quick-tempered, not addicted to wine, not pugnacious, not fond of dishonest gain, but hospitable, loving what is good, sensible, righteous, holy, self-controlled. Holding fast the faithful word which is in accordance with the teaching so that he will be able to exhort in sound doctrine and to reprove those who contradict. Now last week as we started working through verses 5 and 6, we found that we can summarize the whole of the book of Titus with three key words. There are themes that we actually took some time last time and we traced them through the book of Titus and it's comfortable to do that. It's a very short little book, only three chapters and I don't know if you remember what those key words were but let me remind you they were irreproachable or blameless leaders, sound doctrine and good works. Those are the key themes of the letter of Titus and that is really how we can summarize God's design for the church is he wants blameless leaders, he wants sound doctrine to be taught, and as a result of those two, to have good works in his people in the local church. Now, just to remind you, and and if you weren't here last week, you'll have to go and listen to that sermon, but we started uh, our study of what God's design is for church leadership specifically, and we saw that in verses 5 and 6, we have five components of God's design for church leadership. Let me just remind you of what they are. The the first is this, God's design is for elders to appoint elders. There's a, 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 a way of appointing leaders in the church that started with Christ, and we saw that elders are to appoint elders. Paul appointed Titus, and he leaves Titus on Crete to appoint elders there, and then the expectation is, that as those churches grow, they then will in turn find faithful men and appoint them as elders. The second component of God's design for church leadership was this. It's that there need to be multiple elders in each local congregation. We saw that. They do it in each city. And it's plural, multiple elders. And we looked at many ways that is wise and the benefits that has for the local church. The third component we saw was that it is in each local church. It's not multiple elders that rule over a whole group of places. No, it's multiple elders in each location. And we saw that that primarily ends up being uh, not only for the fruit of that, that local body, but it's protective against false teaching spreading from one church to another as it does so easily in a denomination. Well, today we come to the fourth component, and I'm going to remind you what that is. I did give it to you last time, but it's this. God's design is to have multiple male elders in each local church. Um, as, I, as I worked and prepared for the sermon, um, I uh, got stuck on this point. So we're not going to get to point five this week either, um, that the men need to be blameless. But we're going to focus in on a point that's made here by Paul, and it's this, that the elders need to be men. Look, at, look with me at verse 5 again. Paul says the following, For this reason I left you in Crete, that you would set in order what remains, and appoint elders in every city as I directed you, 
And then verse 6, look what he says there. He says, namely, if any man is beyond reproach, the husband of one wife. And then he goes into the character traits of what that leader needs to be. Now, in your English translation, I'm pretty sure it seems a straightforward issue, doesn't it? In, in my translation, it says, if any man is beyond reproach and the husband of one wife, it just seems to be pretty straightforward that an elder is a man. And yet this issue of whether men can be in ministry, men can be elders or pastors or teachers within a church, uh, remains an area of uh, great debate and much uh, confusion and contention at the moment. Uh, in fact, I, I did some research yesterday, and what I found is that for the last 200 years, so please note that's recent history, but for the last 200 years, almost every church denomination has started ordaining women to be in the ministry in the role of a pastor or an elder. And slowly but surely, it just keeps spreading to different church groups. Uh, just by way of example, um, since the, the, the genesis of this church was Baptist, uh, in the Baptist Union of Great Britain, they have a booklet which you can buy from them which has to do with this issue. And I just want to read for you their write-up on it, so it gives you a bit of a, a, bit of a taste of what's going on in the church world. Uh, for, and this is now, this is not history, this is now, I looked at it last night. For over 80 years, Baptists have affirmed the ordaining of women to ministry, yet the proportion of women Baptist ministers remains disappointingly small. One of the reasons that might explain this confusion amongst some Baptist churches and their leaders regarding the legitimacy of min women's ministry so they're saying there might be some confusion, so this booklet clears that up. Uh, they, they end the blurb on the book like this. They say, women, Baptists, and ordination, that's the name of the book, addresses the biblical, historical, and practical reasons why the Baptist Union of Great Britain wholeheartedly endorses ordained ministry of women, helping churches to consider their theology and policy on this issue. So that's kind of within the circles, just in another country, that we would expect uh, churches to be moving that are evangelical, that are saying they're Bible-believing and that the scripture is without error and it's authoritative. Uh, what's really made the news recently, maybe you've heard of uh, Rick Warren and the Purpose Driven Life or the Purpose Driven Church. It, it was a very famous book many years ago, and I think it still does the round. Well, Rick Warren, who's no longer the pastor of that church, Saddleback Church, um, that's a Southern Baptist convention church. It's a very big convention, it's a massive group in America. And recently they made the news because at Saddleback they ordained several, several women to be their pastors. Uh, and this is a conservative church. Uh, it's a church that holds verbally to the inerrancy and authority of Scripture. So this issue is now something that is in the news in America. Go Google it, uh, um, Saddleback and Women Pastor, and you're going to find articles from New York Times, Los Angeles Times, within Christianity Today. It's a big issue, and it's not going to go away. So a question for us this morning is, how do we know that elders are men according to God's design? Well, look again at verse one, uh, chapter 1, verse 5. I left you in Crete that you would appoint elders in every city as I directed, if any man is beyond reproach, the husband of one wife. So how we know, and this morning this is going to be the focus of our study, how we know that God's design is for men to be elders. And just by the way, let me just say this up front. If the scripture said women must be elders too, we would obey that. That's not the question. We submit to the authority of the scriptures. However, the scriptures are clear that men are elders, not women. Men are pastors, not women. And I want to lay forward to you from the scripture this morning how we know that. And we'll look at basically four, four aspects or four points as we work through the text. And it's going to be this. The first is we know this from the context of Titus. We don't need to leave Titus to have the answer. But I'm going to build up the evidence for you and show you from the broader scriptures that this is the case. 
So first of all, we know that they are men because of the context of Titus. We also will see that it's from the context of Paul's other letters, statements he makes elsewhere. Third, we'll see it's by Christ's design and the example of the early church. And I mean early church in the scriptures. And then lastly, it's because it's consistent with God's design in creation for the family. So let's start and look at the context of Titus. In verse uh, 1 here, he says, I want you to appoint elders. The word elder comes from the word presbyteros. And that is actually an adjective. And an adjective in Greek can be masculine or feminine or neuter in its grammatical form. And he uses a masculine form here. However, that in itself is not an argument for why this is a man. Okay, I'm just giving you a little bit of language here and it's important. Because the word of God is breathed out by God and even down to the grammar matters. So he uses masculine forms throughout here. But that is not the strongest argument as to why this is a male. Because in Greek, to the best of my knowledge, if you wanted to refer to men and women, you could do it by using a masculine form. So this is not a decisive argument. Okay, It is possible to use that form. Unless, of course, we actually have a feminine word that refers specifically to older women. And guess what? There is a word. It gets used later in Titus chapter 2 where he speaks of older women. It's presbutis, which is a female form, an older woman. And uh, I believe that if you go to 1 Timothy 3, if you can remember in 1 Timothy 3 where he also speaks about the qualities of an elder, can you remember what follows after that? There's also the discussion of the qualities of a deacon. Okay, 1 Timothy 3. We don't have time to go there, but you can just look at it at home. Uh, he goes, elders, yeah, their qualities. Then he says, deacons need to have these qualities. Then in the middle of that argument of deacons, right in the middle, he speaks about women. Now, there is no feminine word for deacon in uh, Greek. You use the same word for a man or a woman. So to speak about female deacons, he uses the word woman, and then he goes back to male deacons. Now, I believe why that is, is because he's speaking about male deacons and female deacons. So when he wants to speak about an office in the church, and he wants to say there are men who can be in that office and women who could be in that office, he actually makes that clear in the context of his argument. He does not do that anywhere, Paul, where he speaks about elders, because elders are men. All right. So, but language-wise, there's something far more important here, and it's found in verse 6. How do we know that the person he refers to as any man in verse 6, by the way, that again is a little pronoun which can refer to a man or a woman. So really it says anyone, anyone who is beyond reproach. How, why is it that our Bibles translate it man? Well, the context determines the meaning. And look at what the next phrase is. If anyone is beyond reproach, the what of one wife? The husband. You see, that phrase is what is key. That tells you that that pronoun and that that elder he's speaking to is a man. The husband of one wife. The context helps us understand that. If you want a Greek lesson in Greek afterwards, come see me. I'll be glad to give it to you. But you guys need to realize that, that in the context of Titus alone, it is clear that an elder is a man. And based on the way Paul argues in other places about offices in the church, had he meant there, us to understand that it could be women, he would use the phrase and discuss that the woman needs to be faithful to her husband. He does do that in other places, but when it comes to elders and church leadership, he is very specific that they are men. And so from the context of Titus and the language it uses here, we see that uh, an elder is a man. Well, there's further evidence, and we find it in uh, Paul's other writings. This is the second line of evidence, and it's in Paul's letters. Go to 1 Timothy. It's just a few pages back in your Bible. 
in 1 Timothy chapter 3. And now I'm taking you to the context of Paul's writings elsewhere, outside of Titus. Titus, if we allow it to stand and, and say what it says in that context, all the elders in the different churches in Crete, they are to be men. Okay, in 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 1, we read the following. It's a trustworthy saying, if any man aspires to the office of overseer, and that, that's just a synonym with elder, the office of overseer, he desires a good work. An overseer then must be above reproach and the husband of one wife. And there again we see that he, in speaking about elders, and this is now in a different church, not, not in Crete, in a different church, that an elder needs to be the husband of one wife. In other words, it's a man. However, in, in chapter 2 of the same letter, I want you to just look up to the chapter that proceeds in chapter 2, verse 12. Look at this statement that Paul makes. Could he be any clearer than this statement? I do not allow a woman to teach or exercise authority over a man, but to remain quiet. And verse 11 is important. He says a woman must learn in quietness and all submission. But verse 12 is key. In fact, let me read for you. You don't need to turn there, but just write it down. 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verses 34 and 35. Listen what he says there. He says, Women are to keep silent in the churches, for they are not permitted to speak, but, bear, uh, but are to subject themselves, just as the law also says. But if they desire to learn anything, let them ask their own husbands at home, for it's disgraceful for a woman to speak in church. Now, these texts that I've drawn for you from the Corinthian church, and, and, and Timothy is in Ephesus, so from the Ephesian church, uh, they fit perfectly for, with what we've heard here in Titus, what we've read there. And so what we find in Paul is a consistency as he writes at different time periods and to different churches. There's a consistency in what he teaches. And really there is clarity. It's not obscure. I, I don't see anything obscure when he says, I do not allow a woman to teach or exercise authority, but to remain quiet. Now there's a context there, but... That's a pretty straightforward statement, is it not? It's clear. Now, in light of these two, I, I would I like to bring to your attention two arguments that people in conservative churches who hold to the inerrancy and authority of scriptures, those churches which are most denominations out there who have rejected the scriptures, we're not talking about them. We're talking about evangelical churches that say they hold to the authority of Scripture, like Saddleback and others. Two arguments that they make in order to justify having women elders and pastors. Okay, The first argument is this. Some people argue that you need to separate being a pastor and a preacher and a teacher in the church. You need to separate that from the office of elder. So they, they, they say they're two separate things. They say that uh, being a pastor is actually a gift. We know the Holy Spirit gives gifts of various types, serving gifts, teaching gifts. Uh, in the scriptures, Paul makes that clear and elsewhere. You've got different gifts and each, each individual believer is by the Holy Spirit given unique gifting to serve the body of Christ. We understand that. But they argue that pastor-teacher is one of those gifts and then what they say, and for example, they go to Ephesians 4 where it says Christ gave gifts to the church, some as prophets, some as apostles, some as uh, evangelists, some as pastor teachers. They go to that verse because it speaks about gifting. And they say wherever else you go in the scripture and you have gifting, there's no distinction made between men and women. And therefore we need to distinguish the gift of preaching and pastoring from the office, the official office of ruling as an elder in the local church. And so they say gifts are not limited to men. Pastor teacher is a gift. Therefore, you can have 
women and men as pastor teachers according to the gifting God gives them. That's one argument that is made. Is that clear? I need to see a, a nod. Yes, thank you. Great. Well, the second argument is the following. Um, they go to, for example, this passage, which is pretty clear in, in, in Timothy, in 1 Timothy 2.12, where it says, I do not allow a woman to teach. Uh, and they go to the other verses and passages, the ones in Corinthians and, for example, Titus and Timothy on the elders. What they say there is, yes, Paul does say there that women cannot preach or teach or be an elder. They say, yes, but yes, the thing, it was for that time. It was for the circumstance in that church at that time. And we are now in different times and we don't have the same circumstances. And there are various ranges in this argument. And so, it, yes, it applied there at that time. Paul taught that and that, that's what he said. But, you know, we are beyond that. And it depends on the line of argument. You know, we've either moved beyond that patriarchal context of the ancient Near East of those days. We're different now, so it doesn't apply. Um, and there's various ways of arguing it. The point is, they say, it was historically and culturally bound to that period. We are in a different period. It therefore does not apply to us anymore. And so they, for example, will say there was a unique situation in Ephesus. That's why Paul gave this instruction to Timothy. Or, as we know, the Corinthian church, which was a very worldly church, and in chaos, because the chapters that follow in chapters 12 to 14, there was chaos in the church, absolute chaos in the use of the gifts of the Holy Spirit at that time. Uh, everyone was doing whatever they wanted, and they say it was just because of that that Paul gave this instruction. So specific issues was culturally and historically bound, and the other argument was that it's a separation between gifting and pastors. Now, I give that to you. You may never have heard of that before, but you might hear it. This issue is not going to go away. Okay, the pressure is always there on the church. And so we must be clear on these things. And I'm giving you just the two arguments because there are many more. I have whole thick books on this issue like that with articles dealing with the various arguments. I'm giving you those two because they are the ones that I think we're more, most likely to hear in our circles. So Titus is clear. First Timothy 2 is clear. First Corinthians 14 is clear. The, there Paul says elders are men. So what I want to answer is was this culturally bound and can we have gifted women preachers who not necessarily rule, but they have the gift of teaching and pastoring. How do we respond to those? So I'm going to, I'm going to chase both those rabbits. I'm going to hunt them down. And by the way, I've got a loaded gun. I'm going to shoot them. <laughs> okay. All right. And, and I'm doing this for a reason. We're, we're stopping and we're pausing. We're, we're chasing these rabbits. We're hunting them down. Because we need to be, as believers, Bereans. Do you remember them? When Paul came and preached the gospel, they went to the scriptures and they said, is he telling the truth? Right? I don't want you to say, but my pastor said. I want you to go to the scripture and say, I hold to this because this is what God's word says. I am nothing. And like I said to you before, if God commands us to allow women to be preachers, then that's what we'll do. But it doesn't. And it's pretty clear. Okay, so I want to help you be a Berean. I want you to have clarity on what the Bible teaches. I want you to be encouraged and boldly obey the word of God on whatever he says on this issue. And more so, I want to equip you so that you can give an answer to somebody lovingly, gently, and boldly what the scripture teaches on these things. So is what Paul teaches culturally bound? The answer is no. Uh, and first of all, we see in the book we're studying in Titus, where he speaks about male elders. Please remember, he says, go and appoint elders in every church on the island. Go wherever you go and you've got churches on the island of Crete. They need to be male elders. In fact, in Acts 14.23, where Paul went on his first missionary journey, it was in the area which we know as Turkey today. In the Galatian region, in multiple different languages there, different places. And what he did, we're told, is he went back and he appointed elders in all those churches. The picture is 
multiple elders in multiple local congregations and they're men. There's nothing in Titus that limits this just to Titus. There's nothing in that text that limits this to Crete. In fact, when Paul speaks, yeah, and if you're still in 1 Timothy in chapter 2, he says there, I do not allow a woman to teach or exercise or authority, have authority over a man, but to remain quiet. I want you to notice something in chapter 3 of that letter. He says the following. Remember, the argument is that it's culturally bound. Well, Paul actually makes a statement in this letter which tells you it's not culturally bound. Okay? Uh, in, in 1 Timothy 1, chapter 1, verse 3, he says um, the following. He says, I exhorted you when going to Macedonia, remain on in Ephesus. So that's how we know the letter is written to Timothy in Ephesus that you may command certain ones not to teach different doctrine. So he's actually left Paul there, uh, sorry, Paul has left Timothy in Ephesus to address false teaching in the church. And then he makes this statement about women learning quietly. By the way, it, that itself is revolutionary. In that period, in the Roman culture, Women were, and in the Jewish culture, women were second rate and nothing. It is a Christian idea to ensure that the women are learning and educated and growing and participating. That comes from us, not the world. Don't forget that. So chapter 3, you get to this statement. He says in verse 14, I am writing these things to you, hoping... To come to you soon, but in case I am delayed, I write that you will know how one ought to conduct himself just in the church of Ephesus. Is that what it says? No. What does it say? In the household of God, which is the church of the living God, which is the pillar and support of the truth. By his own words, in the context of this letter, he's saying, my instruction is for the church. And do you understand that goes for then and it goes for you and I today? There's nothing that binds these instructions culturally to that time period. This is for the church of all time. In fact, even in that verse in 1 Corinthians 14 where he speaks about learning from your husband and being quiet, that is something in verse 33 of chapter 14 of 1 Corinthians. He makes a similar statement. He says, this is our practice in all the churches. It's not limited just to the Corinthian church. And so from the scripture, from its context, there's clarity. It's not culturally bound. Okay. In our culture, when it says we've moved beyond that, there must be full equality, etc. in those statements, and that the church must move away from that kind of thinking, well, that's the culture trying to impose its standard on the scriptures of God, and we will have none of that. By the way, I want you to think about the implications of this. this if you say, no, it's limited by culture, and, and really most of the churches that I know, the Dutch Reformed Church and so on, this is the argument that they use to justify having women preachers that um, it was culturally bound and we're beyond that and in our culture it's acceptable. Uh, by the way, just think about this. If I say, yes, okay, it was culturally bound and you can therefore, uh, what, what happens? If we don't have to obey these instructions, guess what? We can excuse anything. We can just say, well, they, homosexuality was just culturally bound. Therefore, it's okay today. So what you accept from Scripture is limited then only by your own, own desires. And you become God. Because you can decide which Scriptures mean what and whether they apply or not. And the result that I've seen in the church in the, the handful of decades that I've been alive is I, I see churches today that claim to be evangelical, that claim to be Bible-believing and behold to the authority of Scripture, they are accepting of adultery and they excuse it from the Scriptures. They are accepting of sexual immorality within the body. They are accepting of homosexuality. They are accepting of abortion. 
They're accepting of mutilating children nowadays for gender purposes. And the reason is because they can simply come to the scripture and say it's culturally bound. We are beyond that. Our culture, it is acceptable. Therefore, we must, we can do it. This you will see in all the churches that are caving now on the women ministry. What was the next thing that happened? Those same churches ordained homosexuals. And that is where the next step goes and it just will not stop. That is the reality of where this goes. And you can replace homosexual with any other kind of aberrant thing. There is no limit then. The scripture loses its authority and you become God. So are Paul's instructions culturally bound? No. They are explicitly for the church at large. Therefore we must obey. Now that rabbit's dead. Let's chase the other one. Okay, can we separate being a pastor teacher from the office of elder? Can you, can you say there are two different things? Gifting and, a, and an office. Well, the answer is no. All right, if, again, 1 Timothy 2, if you're still there, 1 Timothy 2, 12. Think of these two things, the teaching, preaching of a pastor, pastor teacher, and authority and rule of an elder. Please listen what Paul says. I do not allow a woman to teach. There's the pastor teaching side. Or exercise authority over a man. There's the elder rule side. What did Paul say? No. Titus 1, verse 9, and we can now head back to our little letter. Titus 1, verse 9, a key element of being a pastor teacher of, of preaching the word of God, of teaching sound doctrine, that is the role of an elder. That is what he's speaking of here. Elders are those, in verse 9, who hold fast the faithful word, which, in accordance with the teach, which is in accordance with the teaching, so that he will be able to both exhort in sound doctrine and reprove those who contradict. You cannot separate those two because the Bible doesn't do it. The Bible's teaching is that an elder is the one in the context of the local church that preach, preaches and teaches and exercises authority. In fact, uh, I want to show you something from two, two uh, places in the scriptures, and these are outside of Paul, though they do describe something Paul did. In Acts 20... You're, you're welcome to just write this down if you want to. Acts 20, verse 17, and then verse 28. I just want to show you this link. Uh, a, a shepherd, a pastor, poimenas, a pastor teacher, a didaskalus, right? That's what that is. Poimenas means to pastor. Um, in Acts 20, verse 17, we read, now from Miletus, Paul sent to Ephesus and called to him the elders of the church. So these are elders, he calls. And when you jump down to verse 28, you see, he says to the elders, Be on guard for yourselves and for all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God which he purchased with his own blood. That word shepherd is the word that is the verb form of pastor so in other words he's made you pastors of the church you cannot separate ruling as an elder from pastoring that is the domain of the elder in the local church and first peter chapter 5 verses 1 and 2 speaks of elders they're shepherding they're pastoring and they're overseeing it's one thing so you cannot make that distinction and say the one is a gift and the other is an office. It doesn't fly. So scripturally, Paul's teaching is authoritative for us, is it not? Because that is God's word for us. And it's authoritative by God's design for the church of all time until Christ returns. Both those rabbits, I trust, are dead. Because there is just no sound scriptural evidence to it. And what I find very sad is... One of the best exegetes on Ephesians makes this argument. And he's supposed to be a conservative guy. And you know what he does with 1 Timothy 2? 
he says, oh, that's a very difficult passage. And then he deals with it very shortly, but he kind of ignores it. That's just not good exegesis. And so I trust that you can see that the teaching of Scripture is that an elder needs to be a man and that these arguments that are typically put forward uh, have no biblical grounds. They have no authority from the Word of God. So having gone off those rabbits, let's, let's come back to our passage. How do we know that it's God's design that an elder needs to be a man? Well, first of all, in the context of Titus 1, we saw that is a one-woman man, a husband of one, one woman, and that limits and helps us understand he's a man. And then secondly, the context of what Paul says elsewhere in his writings. Well, there's a third argument, and it's this, just shortly. It's by Christ's design. Christ designed it this way, and we can see it in the example that we have in the New Testament. Were the apostles, the official 12 apostles, were they men or women? They were all men. Did women have a very significant role to play in Jesus' ministry? Without doubt. That's, the Gospels are full of it. But those who Jesus appointed and trained and focused on as the foundation of his church to preach the word of God, to shepherd and to lead, who were they? They were men. And then all the elders in the Jerusalem church that we see in the book of Acts, who were they? They were men. There were male apostles, male elders appointed by the apostles, and then they were instructed, to, like Paul does to Timothy and Titus, to go and appoint more elders. And those were male elders. And really, let me just say this. In the Old Testament through the New Testament, there's a consistent line that those who are the leaders of God's people are men. They need to be qualified men, but they are men. And the reason is because that follows God's design for his creation, starting with a family. And it leads into his people and the body in which we exist. And so that really is the fourth reason, the fourth reason we know that it needs to be men, and it's this. It's because it's consistent with God's design for the family. Now we have time, so would you turn with me to Genesis? I just want to. Genesis is an important book, and the reason why it's so attacked is because it lays the foundation for most of the key doctrines of all of Scripture. And one of those things is the nature of male and female. That's not a hot topic, is it? Well, it addresses that. Uh, it addresses marriage, it addresses family, it addresses the roles of husband and wife. And we see in Genesis 1 verse 27, let's start there. This is a very important vo uh, verse for us. And I don't think anybody, I've never met a, a believer in Christ who questions this, but we must lay it out before us. Uh, verse 27 of chapter 1 of Genesis, it says, God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. So we have male and female, but the phrase I want you to hook onto there is, we are all equally made in the image of God. There's no question about that. Chapter 2, verse 7, is where Moses just focuses in on the details of that day where God created man and woman. And verse 7 says, Then Yahweh, so this is chapter 2, verse 7, Yahweh God formed man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostril and the breath of life. And so the man became a living being. Verse 8, Then Yahweh planted a garden in Eden towards the east, and there he placed the man whom he formed. So God starts creation by creating Adam first. Okay, he makes Adam and there's a whole lot of things that happen, and then afterwards he creates Eve. Verse 18, Yahweh God said, it's not good for the man to be alone. I will make him a helper suitable for him. And then verse 21, so Yahweh God caused a deep sleep to fall on the man, and he slept, and he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh in that place. And Yahweh God fashioned the rib which he had taken from the man into a woman, and he brought her to the man. And what happens? The first bit of poetry, right, in the scriptures, he sees his, his wife and immediately he says, This one finally is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. 
This one shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife and they will become one flesh. So a few things to note here. God created man. God did. Right? He created man. And man exists to do what God his creator desires. And man must act according to God's desire. That's given. Man and woman are made in the image of God equally. There's no distinction there. We are all in the image of God. Uh, note that man is created first. That's important. Adam came first. And woman is created specifically to be Adam's helper. Now just think about this. Adam was not lonely. All right? Adam was not lonely. Adam was perfectly content in the situation in which God made him in those first hours, obviously. But God said, you are not complete until I make a woman for you. See, by God's design, he wanted Adam to be the head of the family. By God's design, he wanted Adam to accomplish all that is set for him. But he said, you can't do it without a helper. Someone made in my image, equally in my image, but you need a helper. You're not complete. I would be utterly and totally useless and lost if it wasn't for Alna. I guarantee it. She needs to be your companion. The wording there is, is pushing you to understand companionships is involved. And it's a person who's of benefit to Adam and who works alongside him. He can achieve his God-given purpose on earth with this helper. And each one has a role. Adam is created first. He's the head. He is given the instruction. He takes responsibility for the fall of man. Do you realize that? He is the head. And then the roles are such that you have a head and you have a helper. You have a selfless leader and you have a submissive companion. That's by design of different roles. So the man and woman in their roles, they complement each other. They form a perfect unity by God's design. Perfectly designed by God. Now, look what Paul does with this, just as an example, in 1 Corinthians 11. You don't need to turn there, just write it down. 1 Corinthians 11, uh, which is a very interesting passage. But just want to pull out some things that Paul does there. Verse 3, he says, I want you to understand that Christ is the head of every man. And that the man is the head of the woman, and that God is the head of Christ. And then in verse 8 he said, The man did not originate from the woman, but the woman from the man. For indeed the man was not created for woman's sake, but the woman for man's sake. He's just exegeting Genesis 1 for us. And then in Ephesians he does a similar thing. He says, Wives, be subject to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church. He himself being the savior of the body. But as the church is subject to Christ, so also wives ought to be to their husbands in everything. And then he says, husbands, love your wives in the same way that Christ loves the church and gave himself up for her. So you've got those, those very important roles, but he's drawing on the relationship of Christ to the church. And then in Ephesians 5, the next thing he does is quote from Genesis. You see, it's foundational to our understanding of the relationship of a man and a woman in a family. And so he says God's design for the family is equal image bearers, but different roles. Adam is the head and he loves his wife sacrificially. So it's not selfish. Do you see that? Let's not forget that. It's not selfish. It's sacrificial. But he's still the head. Okay? He's the head who loves her sacrificially. And then the wife is the helper who submits willingly. Different roles equally in the image of God. And then God's design for the church. Let's go back to that. Men and women equally image bearers, equally saved. Galatians 3 verse 28 Equally saved. There's no distinction in salvation between a slave and his master, between a man and a woman, between a Jew and a Gentile. We're equally saved in the eyes of God. 
But then in his design for the church, some men, not all men, some men, are called by God to lead and preach, and women are to learn and faithfully serve according to the gifting God has given them. Do you see that design? And so the design for the church fits in well with God's design for the family, where you have a male head and a wife, and you have then male leadership in the church and the rest of the body. So here's the key. I don't want us to forget this. This is God's design. God's design. And it reflects the relationship between the persons in the Trinity. Do you realize that? God is the Father. He is God. We have the Son, Jesus Christ, who is God. And we have the Holy Spirit, who is God. And if you look at the Scriptures, just quickly to jump to the creation... In the creation account, we have uh, God creating and we have His Spirit. And in the New Testament, it clarifies for us that God the Father created all things through His Son. And we know in Genesis 1 that the effective force, that uh, the effective person of the Trinity who created was the Holy Spirit. All three are involved. Each had a distinct role to play. This God is the head of Christ, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 11. There's a relationship that is reflected between Christ and the church in Ephesians 5. So yes, the implication. If you reject male-only leaders in the church, and you, you reject male-only pastors and preachers, you are rejecting God's design. And you are attacking the Trinity. If you say a woman must be equal to men in all things, especially on the, on the level of roles, function, in the church, for it, for it, because think about it, people say you're evil, you're oppressive, if you don't allow women to have exactly the same function and role, then you're evil, you're oppressive. So if you say that there must be this full equality, then you must be consistent and say that Christ submitting to the Father is oppressive. Do you get that? Who's going to say that? I'm not. You have to then look at Paul's argument where he goes to the Trinity and he points to you to there's willing submission of the Son to the Father. Well, if you're saying it's evil to not allow distinct roles in God's design for men and women in the church and the home, you then must draw that through to the Trinity. Or if you say that a wife must not submit to her husband, there must be absolute egalitarian equality then you must be consistent and say that where Christ is the head of the church, well, then the church can be the head of Christ. Who's going to say that? You cannot say that. I want you to see that's where this argument, you must take this argument because that's what the scripture does. It's a serious matter and we need to take it seriously. If, if you reject the plain teaching of Scripture on this and any issue, but this one spe specifically, you are attacking God. We attack His character, His design, and really what we are doing is rebelling against the authority of His Word. So I trust and I thank you for your patience in allowing me to spend all this time on one simple issue, but it is... Very important. Very important. Young ladies, you are being pressured in this sphere. Uh, ladies who are at work, you've seen this. You're facing this pressure. All of us do. We need to be clear on what the scripture teaches. So how do we know that God's design is that uh, for the church is male elders? We've seen it in the context of Titus 1. We've seen it across all Paul's teaching. We've seen it in Christ's own design for the church and the way he implemented leadership. And we've seen it is consistent with God's design for the family and really for society. And so as we conclude 
uh, this morning, and we do have a few minutes as we conclude, I want to make a few closing remarks just to bring this home. The first is this. Everything God says in his word about male leadership in the church is very offensive to our society. It is very f- offensive. But there is an underlying assumption. Uh, Paul speaks of tearing down strongholds in society, ungodly ways of thinking, ungodly philosophies. Now, I want to point to you to this one underlying Assumption, it's really, really obvious when we just stop and think about what the world is arguing here. And here's the problem, okay? What's the problem if someone argues with you on this and teaches, uh, wants you to disobey God's word on this, this is most probably where their assumption is. Listen, listen, it's this. That they have made the roles, different function, different roles of men and women as a measurement of your value. That's the problem. They're saying, if you can't have equal roles, you are saying, I am not as good as or as valuable as that man. So submission of women to men in the home and church and the different roles for men and women, they're saying that's a measure of my value as a person. And you're saying, if, uh, they're saying it's indicative of whether you're inferior or superior. But that's false. That's a false way of thinking. It's unbiblical. It's something we must tear down and address. Go for that. That's where you cut the throat of that beast. Okay, let me read for you what Betsy Ricucci says in a book called Love That Lasts. It's a book on marriage and family, but it's, it's good uh, to, to hear what she says. She says, to God, a role is never a measure of someone's value. It's an expression of divine order and wisdom. They are a means God uses to accomplish his purposes. So what I want to encourage you is if someone brings this up and you have the opportunity to share what the scriptures teach on this, go to this assumption and say, you're assuming that if I play a different role, that it's indicative of whether I'm valuable or not. That's not true. Guess what? It doesn't work in real life, does it? Is everybody in the company the CEO? Is everybody the chief financial officer? Is everybody the janitor? Is everybody the IT person? Can the janitor make executive decisions with the board? No, it does not work anywhere else. Don't impose it on the church. It's common sense. Okay? And then take them also to these arguments and point out to them, you're attacking the Trinity if you do this. And so you have the ability to answer them. You are made equally in the image of God and saved by Jesus Christ equally. Is there any value higher than that? No. The second remark I'd like to make is that there is a warning to us in the church as Christians about these issues. And uh, I'm not going to address it now. I'm going to actually ask that in our Bible study when we review the sermon that we look at this. But you can jot down Matthew 21, 7, 21. Matthew 7, 21 and, f- and the verses that follow, and 1 Samuel 15, right? And I asked myself this question this week, and I said, can I think of an example in the Old or New Testament where God specifically addresses His people and tells us what He thinks of us when we worship Him but not according to His design? The answer is yes, go look at those chapters, and you'll see what He says about that. So the church that just goes on and and comes and worships and sings and preaches, but not by his design, who rejects male leadership and then puts female pastors in place. Does God say something about that? The answer is yes. And you can look at 1 Samuel 15 and Matthew 7, 21 for that. The third remark is this. The church that rejects this part of God's design is not accepting the authority of God's word. And therefore, do not accept the authority of God. It rejects his word and therefore rejects God. Let me tell you something. If you find yourself in a church like that, irrespective of how many friends you have, 
of how many years you lived there and were part of that congregation, how many part, you built their pulpit or you built their something or you gave your money, run. Get out. The final remark is this. Churches that reject God's design for male leadership do not produce good works. And the fruit of their lives is rotten. I challenge you to go to any one of those churches and find holiness and blamelessness. You cannot. It's not possible. And if they do have some of it, it's going to go away. Last night I scrolled through websites from multiple famous, big, wealthy, and just, you know, big churches that are supposedly evangelical and even not in our church. And I think most of them I found either male and female pastoral teams, which is unbiblical. So where the husband and wife are considered the pastors. Or just plain women pastors and shepherds. They're all big churches. These are massive, right? We're like a little blip compared to these churches. It doesn't matter how vibrant you are, how big you are, how wealthy you are. It's still rebellion. And it's rotten. John MacArthur says, Why are the standards of, of leadership in the church set so high? Because, listen to this, this is an important point. Because whatever the leaders are, the people become. As Hosea said, like people, like priest. And Jesus said, everyone after he has been fully trained will be like his teacher. Biblical history demonstrates that people will seldom rise above the spiritual level of their leadership. The leadership will be ungodly. The people will be ungodly. So if your leadership says that we will not obey God on this aspect, guess what? the people will not obey God on that aspect. And if you don't, if you knowingly and willingly disobey God's clear teaching, you are going to lead your people into unrighteousness. And you will find other areas in that pastor's life and those people's lives where they are doing exactly the same, rejecting the clear teaching of Scripture. And guess what happens? The people become like the priest. You see, in Titus, and back to our book, the whole point of Titus was faithful, blameless leaders who teach sound doctrine leads to good works. And if you take that out, you will not have sound doctrine and you will not have good, good works. At our church, what will we do? We're going to obey Christ. We're going to obey His design for the church and I know, I know, I see it in the lives of our people that where we obey Him in this and every other area, our families are filled with joy and growth in Christ-likeness. And we see good fruit. Do we not? Let's press on in that. Let's pray. Father God, we do thank You for the clear teaching of Your Word that we can, and its sufficiency, uh, it's sufficiency to deal with all the things we face in this world. Lord, our desire is to humbly obey you. Whatever it is you lay before us and call us to obey in your word. Lord, give us grace, we pray, to stand firm on the truth of your word in this issue and every issue that arises in our society. Help us to know well what you teach and to stand firmly on that and to obey you. Lord, we thank you for the great blessing uh, that comes upon us as individuals and our families and our community as we stand uh, boldly obeying your truth. And we do ask, Father God, that those churches who are perhaps wavering on this issue, that they would turn to the scriptures and find clarity and uh, boldness, with boldness, put, press ahead and obey in these things. Uh, thank you for the way that you have graciously blessed us uh, not only at this church, but at many other churches with faithful men who are qualified, and that you continue to raise them up and through them continue to bring glory to your name as you save for yourself a people who grow in Christ-likeness and are being prepared for the day that Christ our Savior will return and take us as his bride for himself. We do praise you and thank you for this in Jesus' name. 
Amen.